This is Chapter Six of Mark Twain: His Life and Work, a biographical sketch by William M. Clemens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Six: Marriage, read by John Greenman. Among those cultivated people who were passengers on the steamer Quaker City in the now memorable excursion to the Holy Land in 1867 were Judge J. L. Langdon and family of Elmira, New York. A son of Judge Langdon figures as Dan in Innocence Abroad. Miss Lizzie, a handsome and accomplished sister of Dan, was introduced to Mark Twain during the voyage outward and when the quaker city sailed homeward mr clemens was paying deep attention to the young lady she was somewhat of an invalid and upon the return of the family to elmira her illness took a more serious form perhaps the proximity of buffalo to elmira the home of his sweetheart occasioned mark's removal to the former city in the latter part of eighteen sixty nine for at all events we find him there occupying an editorial position on the buffalo express subsequently we find him making periodical visits to the neighboring city of elmira miss langdon was a young lady of position and fortune mark knew that her father did not look upon him with favor but nevertheless he acquired sufficient courage to propose and was rejected much to his sorrow well he said to the lady i didn't much believe you'd have me but i thought i'd try after a while he tried again with the same result and then he remarked with his celebrated drawl i think a great deal more of you than if you'd say yes but it's hard to bear a third time he met with better fortune and then came to the most difficult part of his task to address the old gentleman judge he said to the dignified millionaire have you seen anything going on between miss lizzie and me what what exclaimed the judge rather sharply apparently not understanding the situation yet doubtless getting a glimpse of it from the inquiry have you seen anything going on between uh, miss lizzie and me no no indeed replied the magnate sternly no sir i have not well uh, look sharp and you will the judge did look sharp after that and one day he called the ardent and devoted young man into his study and said after some preamble mr clemens i have something to say to you which bears upon a subject of great importance at least to me and mine you have been coming here for some time and your manners leave no doubt in my mind as to your object now my daughter's welfare is very dear to me and before i can admit you to her society on the footing of a suitor to her hand i would like to know something more than i do about you your antecedents etc stop a minute you must remember that a man may be a, a good fellow and a pleasant companion on a voyage and all that but when it is a question as grave as this a wise father tries to take every precaution before allowing his daughter's affections to become engaged and i ask of you as a gentleman that you shall give me the names of some of your friends in california to whom i may write and make such inquiries as i deem necessary that is if you still desire our friendship mark put on a bold front sir said he bowing profoundly as became a young man who respects his hoped-for father-in-law your sentiments are in every way correct i approve of them myself and hasten to add that you have not been mistaken in my sentiments towards your daughter whom i may tell you candidly seems to me to be the most perfect of her sex and i honor your solicitation for her welfare i am not only perfectly willing to give you reference but am only too glad 
to have an opportunity to do so, which my natural modesty would have prevented me from offering. Therefore, permit me to give you the names of a few of my friends. I will write them down. First is Lieutenant General John McComb, Alexander Badlam, General Lander, and Colonel W. H. L. Barnes. They will all lie for me just as I would for them under like circumstances. The prospective father-in-law wrote letters of inquiry to several residents of San Francisco to whom Clemens referred him, and with one exception the letters denounced him bitterly, especially deriding his capacity for becoming a good husband. Mark sat beside his fiancée when the letters were read aloud by the old gentleman. There was a dreadful silence for a moment, and then Mark stammered, "'Well, that's pretty rough on a fellow, anyhow.' His betrothed came to the rescue, however, and overturned the mass of testimony against him by saying, "'I'll risk you, anyhow.' So they were married, the wedding occurring in the parlor of the Langdon residence in Elmira. Mark had instructed his friends in the newspaper office at Buffalo to select him a suite of rooms in a first-class boarding-house in the city, and to have a carriage at the depot to meet the bride and groom. He knew that they would comply with his request, and gave himself no more anxiety about it. When the happy couple alighted from the train at the Buffalo depot, they found a handsome carriage, a beautiful span of horses, and a driver in livery. They were driven to a handsome house on an aristocratic street, and as the door was opened there were the parents of the bride to welcome them home. The old folks had quietly arrived by a special train. After Mark had gone through the house and admired its elegant furnishings, he was informed officially that he had been driven by his own coachman, in his own carriage, to his own house. They say that the tears came to his wonderfully dark and piercing eyes, and that all he could say was, Well, this is a first-class swindle. For nearly a year Mr. Clemens was editorially connected with the Buffalo Express. For this journal he wrote many excellent sketches, among them An Unburlesquable Thing, A Memory, The Widow's Protest, Running for Governor, and others. The Rev. J. Hyatt Smith relates an amusing anecdote of Mark's life in Buffalo. "'When I was living in Buffalo,' says Mr. Smith, "'Mark Twain occupied a cottage across the street. We did not see very much of him, but one morning, as we were enjoying our cigars on the veranda after breakfast, we saw Mark come to his door in his dressing-gown and slippers and look over at us. He stood at his own door and smoked for a minute, as if making up his mind about something, and at last opened his gate and came lounging across the street. There was an unoccupied rocking chair on the veranda, and when my brother offered it to him he dropped into it with a sigh of relief. He smoked for a few moments and said, "'Nice morning.' "'Yes, very pleasant.' shouldn't wonder if we had rain by and by. Well, we could stand a little. This is a nice house you have here. Yes, we rather like it. How's your family? Quite well, and yours? Oh, we're all comfortable. There was a, another impressive silence, and finally Mark crossed his legs blew a puff of smoke in the air, and, in his lazy drawl, remarked, "'I suppose you're a little surprised to see me over here so early. Fact is, I haven't been so neighborly, perhaps, as I ought to be. We must mend that state of things. But this morning I came over because I thought you might be interested in knowing that your roof is on fire. It struck me that it would be a good idea if 
but at the mention of fire the whole family hurried upstairs when we had put the fire out and had returned to the veranda mark wasn't there some years later when mr clemens was lecturing in buffalo after being introduced to the audience he spoke as follows in his low drawling characteristic manner i notice many changes since i was a citizen of buffalo fourteen or fifteen years ago i miss the faces of my old friends they have gone to the tomb to the gallows to the white house thus far the rest of us have escaped but be sure our own time is coming over us with awful certainty hangs one or the other of these fates therefore that we be secure against error the wise among us will prepare for them all this word of admonition may be sufficient let us pass to cheerfuller things i remember one circumstance of bygone times with great vividness i arrived here after dark on a february evening in eighteen seventy with my wife and a large company of friends when i had been a husband twenty-four hours and they put us two in a carriage and drove us up and down and every which way through all the back streets in buffalo until at last i got ashamed and said i asked mr slee to get me a cheap boarding-house but i didn't mean he should stretch economy to the going outside the state to find it the fact was there was a practical joke to the fore which i didn't know anything about and all this fooling around was to give it time to mature my father-in-law the late jervis langdon whom many of you will remember had been clandestinely spending a fair fortune upon a house and furniture in delaware avenue for us and had kept his secret so well that i was the only person this side of the niagara falls that hadn't found it out we reached the house at last about ten o'clock and were introduced to a mrs johnson the ostensible landlady i took a glance around and then my opinion of mr slee's judgment as a provider of cheap boarding-houses for men who had to work for their living dropped to zero i told mrs johnson there had been an unfortunate mistake that mr slee had evidently supposed i had money whereas i only had talent and so by her leave we would abide with her a week and then she could keep my trunk and we would hunt another place then the battalion of ambushed friends and relatives burst in on us out of closets and from behind curtains the property was delivered over to us and the joke revealed such jokes as these are all too scarce in a person's life that house was so completely equipped in every detail even to servants and a coachman that well, there was nothing to do but just sit down and live in it in the fall of eighteen seventy mr clemens resigned his position on the buffalo express and took his residence in hartford connecticut he had received several large sums of money as royalty on his innocence abroad and this together with his wife's funds were invested in local corporations mostly insurance companies during the winter following he wrote roughing it and early in eighteen seventy one the book was published the volume awakened fully as much interest as innocence abroad it is a humorous record of his life in the mining regions and is replete with adventure tragedy and comedy 
the writing of roughing it was inspired according to mark's confession by the stimulating use of tobacco a luxury which he never denied himself even in his days of poverty in speaking upon this point he once said i began smoking immoderately when i was eight years old that is i began with one hundred cigars a month and by the time i was twenty i had increased my allowance to two hundred a month before i was thirty i had increased it to three hundred a month once when i was fifteen i ceased from smoking for three months but i do not remember whether the effect resulting was good or evil i repeated this experiment when i was twenty-two again i do not remember what the result was i repeated the experiment once more when i was thirty-four and ceased from smoking for a year and a half my health did not improve because it was not possible to improve health that was already perfect as i never permitted myself to regret this abstinence i experienced no inconvenience from it i wrote nothing but occasional magazine articles during pastime and as i never wrote one except under strong impulse i observed no lapse of facility but by and by i sat down with a contract behind me to write a book of five or six hundred pages the book called roughing it and then i found myself seriously obstructed i was three weeks writing six chapters then i gave up the fight resumed my three hundred cigars burned the six chapters and wrote the book in three months without difficulty end of chapter six read by john greenman this is chapter seven of mark twain his life and work a biographical sketch by william m clemens this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven in england and germany read by john greenman in eighteen seventy two mark twain sailed for england to arrange for the european publication of his works and successfully securing chatto and windus as his english representatives and the publishing house of tauchnitz at leipzig as his continental agent already he was widely known and quoted in england and was a welcome guest in speaking of his experience in london he says during my sojourn in smoky dirty grand old england i received an invitation to attend a banquet there and i went it was one of those tremendous dinners where there are eight hundred to nine hundred invited guests i hadn't been used to that sort of thing and i didn't feel quite at home when we took our seats at the table i noticed that at each plate was a little plan of the hall with the position of each guest numbered so that one could see at a glance where a friend was seated by learning the number just before we fell to some one uh, the lord mayor or whoever was bossing the occasion arose and began to read a list of those present number one lord so-and-so number two the duke of something or other and so on when this individual read the name of some prominent political character or literary celebrity it would be greeted with more or less applause the individual who was reading the names did so in so monotonous a manner that i became tired 
and began looking about for something to engage my attention. I found the gentleman next to me, on the right, a well-informed personage, and I entered into conversation with him. I had never seen him before, but he was a good talker and enjoyed it. Suddenly, just as he was giving his views upon the future religious aspect of Great Britain, our ears were assailed by a deafening storm of applause. Such a clapping of hands I never heard before. It sent the blood into my head with a rush. I got terribly excited. I straightened up and commenced clapping my hands with all my might. I moved about in my chair and clapped harder and harder. Who is it? I asked the gentleman on my right. Whose name did he read? Samuel L. Clemens, he answered. I stopped applauding. I didn't clap any more. It kind of took the life out of me, and I sat there like a mummy, and didn't even get up and bow. It was one of the most distressing fixes I ever got into, and it will be many a day before I forget it. Mark lectured on various occasions in England with striking success. Rev. H. R. Hawes, who heard him at this time, writes, I heard him once at the Hanover Square Rooms. The audience was not large nor very enthusiastic. I believe he would have been an increasing success had he stayed longer. We had not time to get accustomed to his peculiar way, and there was nothing to take us by storm. He came on the platform and stood quite alone. A little table with the traditional water-bottle and tumbler was by his side. His appearance was not impressive, not very unlike the representation of him in the various pictures in his Tramp Abroad. He spoke more slowly than any other man I ever heard, and did not look at his audience quite enough. I do not think that he felt altogether at home with us, nor we with him. We never laughed loud or long. We sat throughout expectant, and on the qui vive, very well interested and gently simmering with amusement, with the exception of one exquisite description of the old Magdalen ivy-covered collegiate buildings at Oxford University, I do not think there was one thing worth setting down in print. I got no information out of the lecture, and hardly a joke that would wear, or a story that would bear repeating. There was a deal about the dismal, lone uh, Silverland, the, the story of the Mexican plug that bucked, and a duel which never came off, and another duel in which no one was injured, and we sat patiently enough through it, fancying that by and by the introduction would be over and the lecture would begin, when Twain suddenly made his bow and went off. It was over. I looked at my watch. I was never more taken back. I had been sitting there exactly an hour and twenty minutes. It seemed ten minutes at the outside. If you have ever tried to address a public meeting, you will know what this means. It means that Mark Twain is a consummate public speaker. If ever he chose to say anything, he would say it marvelously well, but in the art of saying nothing in an hour, he surpasses our most accomplished parliamentary speakers. Mr. Twain relates, as one of the most harrowing experiences of his life, a six hours' ride across England, his fellow traveler an Englishman, who, shortly after they started, drew forth the first volume of the English edition of Innocence Abroad from his pocket and calmly perused it from beginning to end without a smile. Then he drew forth the second volume and read it as solemnly as the first. Mark says he thought he should die, yet John Bull was probably enjoying it, after his own undemonstrative style. 
Upon his return from England in 1873, in conjunction with Charles Dudley Warner, Mark Twain issued his fourth book, The Gilded Age, which met with remarkable sale in this country and in Europe. In 1876 there appeared the Atlantic Monthly, that famous fragment, Punch Brothers Punch with Care. It had a curious origin. Early in April 1875, the city line of the New York and Harlem Railroad Company, having adopted the punch system, posted in the panels of their cars a card of information and instruction to conductors and passengers, both of whom were indirectly requested to watch the other. It read as follows. The conductor, when he receives a fare, must immediately punch in the presence of the passenger. A blue trip slip for an eight cents fare, a buff trip slip for a six cents fare, a pink trip slip for a three cents fare. For coupon and transfer tickets, punch the tickets. The poesy of the thing was discovered almost as immediately as the conductor immediately punched and all sorts of jingles were accommodated to the measure in september the first poem appeared in print and various versions appeared in the new york and boston newspapers in the january eighteen seventy six atlantic mark twain's literary nightmare appeared with the following version conductor when you receive a fare punch in the presence of the passenger a blue trip slip for an eight cent fare a buff trip slip for a six cent fare a pink trip slip for a three cent fare punch in the presence of the passenger chorus punch brothers punch with care punch in the presence of the passenger said mark i came across these jingling rhymes in a newspaper a little while ago and read them a couple of times they took instant and entire possession of me all through breakfast they went waltzing through my brain and when at last i rolled up my napkin i could not tell whether i had eaten anything or not i had carefully laid out my day's work the day before a thrilling tragedy in the novel which i am writing i went to my den to begin my deed of blood i took up my pen but all i could get to say was punch in the presence of the passenger i fought hard for an hour but it was useless my head kept humming a blue trip slip for an eight cent fare a buff trip slip for a six cent fare and so on and so on without peace or respite the day's work was ruined i could see that plainly enough i gave up and drifted downtown and presently discovered that my feet were keeping time to that relentless jingle when i could stand it no longer i altered my step but it did no good those rhymes accommodated themselves to the new step and went on harassing me just as before i returned home and suffered all the afternoon suffered all through an unconscious and unrefreshing dinner suffered and cried and jingled all through the evening went to bed and rolled tossed and jingled right along the same as ever got up at midnight frantic and tried to read but there was nothing visible upon the whirling page except punch punch in the presence of the passenger by sunrise i was out of my mind and everybody marveled and was distressed at the idiotic burden of my ravings 
the literary nightmare awakened horse-car poets throughout the world algernon charles swinburne in la revue des deux mondes had a brief copy of french verses written with all his well-known warmth and melody le chant du conducteur ayant été pays le conducteur percera en plein vue du voyageur quand il reçoit trois sous un coupon vert un coupon jaune pour six sous c'est l'affaire et pour huit sous c'est un coupon couleur de rose en plein vue du voyageur cœur donc percez soigneusement mes frères tout en plein vue des voyageurs etc the western an enterprising st louis magazine had a terrible attack and addressing marco twain it came out in a latin anthem with the following chorus pungite fratres pungite pungite cum amore pungite pro vectore diligensime pungite a man who had just been reading the literary nightmare said the austin nevada reveille stepped into a main street saloon muttering punch brothers punch with care punch in the presence of the passenger when a retired prize-fighter who was snoozing in a corner got up and accosting the nightmare fellow demanded whose ears are you going to punch you bloody duffer the other fellow tried to explain but the fighter insisted that he the other fellow had said punch brothers punch with care punch that big feller square in the ear the bridgeport standard man said mark twain will sail for europe on business in the spring but if he plays any jokes on the captain there and don't come down with the red glare fair the captain'll probably rip and tear and punch him in the presence of the passenger when the adventures of tom sawyer appeared in eighteen seventy six the fame of mark twain was universal in this volume he revealed the story of his boyhood days on the mississippi and his pranks and adventures in the town of hannibal it was published as a book for boys and commanded an enormous sale edition after edition being exhausted in fact tom sawyer sold better than any of his books excepting innocents abroad in the meanwhile the gilded age had been dramatized and the production of the comedy on the american stage netted the author large sums of money injun joe one of the principal characters in tom sawyer still lives at hannibal missouri and is one of the noted individuals of the town he drives an old white horse and a red express wagon borne down on one side from long and hard service joe hauls trunks from the depot and chores around with his horse and wagon he loves a dollar more than anybody else in the town and out of his meager earnings he has accumulated quite a fortune he owns twelve tenement houses in hannibal ranging in value from five hundred dollars to a thousand dollars each yet from the clothes that he wears one would naturally think that he would be constantly in dread of the ragman coming along and casting him into a sack of old iron and rags a well-known literary critic in reviewing tom sawyer said this literary wag has performed some services which entitle him to the gratitude of his generation he has run the traditional sunday school boy through his literary mangle and turned him out washed and ironed into a proper state of flatness and collapse that whining canting early dying anemic creature was the nauseating model held up to the full-blooded mischievous lads of bygone years as worthy of their imitation he poured his religious hypocrisy over every honest pleasure a boy had he whined his lachrymose warnings on every playground he vexed their lives so when mark grew old enough he went gunning for him and lo wherever his soul may be the skin of the strumous young pietist is now neatly tacked up to view on the sunday school door of to-day as a warning and the lads of to-day see no particular charm in a priggish 
hydropathical existence. In 1877 appeared a volume of his complete sketches, which included most of his fugitive newspaper articles. In the following year, April 11, 1878, he sailed for Europe in the steamship Holsatia. He was accompanied by his family, and after traveling in England, France, and Switzerland, settled down to spend the summer in Germany. Here he obtained the materials for his famous book, A Tramp Abroad. In this volume, Harris, guide and courier, is introduced to the reader. Harris is not only invited to bow promiscuously, but is set on to talk to doubtful people, to entertain bores, and generally to be the butt of embarrassing situations. Mr. Clemens made a minute study of the Germans, their manners, habits, tastes, and amusements. We all remember his treatment of the cases and gender in the German grammar. Meine guten Freunde, meines guten Freunde, meinen guten Freundem, and den and dem, until one feels one might better go without friends in Germany than take all this trouble about them. What a bother, he cries, it is to decline a good male. But that is nothing to the trouble we are landed in by the female. Every man has a gender, and there is no sense or system in the distribution. In German a young lady has no sex, while a turnip has. Thus you say, Wilhelm, where is the turnip? She has gone to the kitchen. Where is the accomplished young lady? It has gone to the opera. Still better were his illustrations of the German fishwife. His argument with a raven, his adventures with a blue jay, and his perilous journey on the river raft were afterward exquisitely described in A Tramp Abroad, published in 1880. While on his return from Germany, he tarried in London and Glasgow, and while in the latter city was elected a member of the Scottish Society of Literature and Art. End of chapter 7 Read by John Greenman This is chapter 8 of Mark Twain, His Life and Work, a biographical sketch by William M. Clemens. Read by John Greenman This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 8 his later works. On September 3, 1879, Mr. Clemens and his family arrived in New York on the steamship Galbier, having been abroad for a period of sixteen months. There, said Mark to a friend, as the ship left quarantine and began her journey up the bay, the danger is finally past. When the ship begins to roll sideways and kick up behind, at the same time, I always know I am expected to perform a certain duty. I learned it years ago on the Quaker City. You might suppose that I would have forgotten my part after so long a residence on shore, but there it is again. It's habit. Everything connected with the sea comes down to a matter of habit. You might confine me for forty years in a Rhode Island corn patch, and at the end of that time I'd know just as well what to do when a ship begins to kick as I do at this moment. The darkest night never confuses me in the least. It's a little singular when you look at it, isn't it? But I presume it's attributable to the solemn steadfastness of the great deep. As a conscientious Republican in his political preferences, Mr. Clemens took an active interest in the presidential campaign of 1880. While visiting in Elmira, New York, in the fall of that year, he made a short speech one Saturday night, introducing to a Republican meeting General Hawley of Connecticut. In the course of his remarks, Mr. Clemens said, General Hawley is a member of my church at Hartford, 
and the author of Beautiful Snow. Maybe he will deny that, but I am only here to give him a character from his last place. As a pure citizen, I respect him. As a personal friend of years, I have the warmest regard for him. As a neighbor whose vegetable garden adjoins mine, why, why, I watch him. As the author of Beautiful Snow, he has added a new pang to winter. He is a square, true man in honest politics, and I must say he occupies a mighty lonesome position. So broad, so bountiful is his character that he never turned a tramp empty-handed from his door, but always gave him a letter of introduction to me. Pure, honest, incorruptible, that is Joe Hawley. Such a man in politics is like a bottle of perfumery in a glue factory. It may modify the stench, but it doesn't destroy it. I haven't said any more of him than I would say of myself. Ladies and gentlemen, this is General Hawley. In November 1880, a charity fair was in progress in Buffalo, and during its course a small journal called the Bazaar Bulletin was published. In one number of this paper appeared a contribution from the pen of Mark Twain, entitled, A Tale for Struggling Young Poets. Well, sir, there was a young fellow who believed that he was a poet, but the main difficulty with him was to get anybody else to believe it. Many and many a poet has split on that rock, if it is a rock. Many and many a poet will split on it, thank God. The young fellow I speak of used all the customary devices, and with the customary results, to wit. He competed for prizes and didn't take any. He sent specimens of poetry to famous people and asked for a candid opinion, meaning a puff, and didn't get it. He took advantage of dead persons and obituaried them in ostensible poetry, but it made him no friends, certainly none among the dead. But at last he heard of another chance. There was going to be a fair in Buffalo, accompanied by the usual inoffensive paper, and the editor of that paper offered a prize of ten dollars for the best original poem on the usual topic of spring. No poem to be considered unless it should possess positive value. Well, sir, he shook up his muse, he introduced into her a rousing charge of information from his jug, and then sat down and dashed off the following madrigal, just as easy as lying. Hail, beauteous, gladsome spring, a poem by S. L. Clemens, number... 1163 Hartford, Connecticut, November 17th. George P. Bissell and Company, Bankers. Pay to Mrs. David Gray or order for F. Ten dollars. Household account S. L. Clemens. Did he take the prize? <laughs> yes, he took the prize. The poem and its title didn't seem to go together very well, but no matter. That sort of thing has happened before. It didn't rhyme, 
neither was it blank verse for the blanks were all filled yet it took the prize for this reason no other poem offered was really worth more than four dollars and fifty cents whereas there was no getting around the petrified fact that this one was worth ten dollars in truth there was not a banker in the whole town who was willing to invest a cent in those other poems but every one of them said this one was good sound seaworthy poetry and worth its face such is the way in which that struggling young poet achieved recognition at last and got a start along the road that leads to lyric eminence whatever that may mean therefore let other struggling young poets be encouraged by this to go striving mark twain not long after this mr clemens acted as an auctioneer at the last sale at a bazaar or fair held in hartford in opening the sale he said well now after a week of work by these ladies who have handled an immense amount of money without putting a penny into their private pockets i their mere clerk propose as clerks will sometimes to knock down something it was at this time that the humorist wrote a letter to a friend in tennessee expressing his admiration for artemus ward as follows dear sir one of the first questions which londoners ask me is whether i knew artemus ward the answer yes makes them my friends on the spot artemus seems to have been on the warmest terms with thousands of those people well he seems never to have written a harsh thing against anybody or neither have i for that matter at least nothing harsh enough for a body to fret about and i think he never felt bitter toward people there may have been three or four other people like that in the world at one time or another but they probably died a good while ago i think his lecture on the babes in the woods was the funniest thing i ever listened to artemus once said to me gravely almost sadly clemens i have done too much fooling too much trifling i am going to write something that will live well what for instance in the same grave way he said a lie it was an admirable surprise i was just getting ready to cry he was becoming pathetic yours truly s l clemens in 1882 mr clemens wrote the stolen white elephant and the same year visited bermuda the following winter james r osgood and company of boston issued the stolen white elephant with which were incorporated some rambling notes of an idle excursion punch brother punch and other sketches about this time the humorist was asked to contribute to the bartholdi pedestal fund here was his response you know my weakness for adam and you know how i have struggled to get him a monument and failed now it seems to me here is my chance what do we care for a statue of liberty when we've got the thing itself in its wildest sublimity what you want of a monument is to keep you in mind of something you haven't got something you've lost very well we haven't lost liberty 
we've lost adam look at adam what have we done for adam what has adam done for us he gave us life he gave us death he gave us heaven he gave us hell with trifling alteration this present statue will answer very well for adam you can turn that blanket into an ulster part the hair on one side or conceal the sex of his head with a fire helmet and at once he's a man put a harp and a halo and a palm branch in the left hand to symbolize a part of what adam did for us and leave the fire basket just where it is to symbolize the rest my friends the father of life and death and taxes has been neglected long enough is it but a question of finance behold the enclosed paid bank checks use them as freely as they are freely contributed heaven knows i would there were a ton of them i would send them all to you for my heart is in this sublime work s l c in eighteen eighty two while mark twain was collecting retrospective material for his life on the mississippi he stopped one day at arkansas city he had years before known the place as campbell's bend and naturally had a desire to poke about unattended by persons who would be likely to break in upon his musings so avoiding the committee that had been appointed to receive him he wandered off into the woods he thought nothing of the distance he was traversing there was music among the treetops and flowers rich in deep coloring perfumed the air after a long walk he came to a cabin and upon entering found an old and tangle-bearded man sitting near the empty fireplace the old fellow glanced at twain and then springing between the visitor and the door snatched down a gun cocked it and said so i've got you have i i don't understand you twain gasped oh no i reckon not air man never understands a thing when he don't want her i didn't stop your steamboat down yonder below the bend the other day and steal sixty sheep that belong to me did you i will swear upon the honor of a gentleman that i did not i haven't been in this neighborhood before in twenty years sit down thar twain obeyed the old man continued it would have been have been a good while since you was here before the other day but you got here just in time to steal them sheep and i'm going to have your scalp hear me my dear sir you are laboring under a frightful mistake i never owned a sheep in my life no i don't reckon you ever did own one in mine that nobody else ain't apt to own nary one or where you hang out yes i uh, come right here and tuck my sheep and her mum was her pet lamb that my little granddaughter loves better than she does her life and she ain't slept her wink since for crying about it oh you needn't blink for i am going to hold you here till my little gal comes and then i'm going to blow your head off it won't be long for she comes and if you've got any prayers that you reckon ought to be said why you better say em that's all my dear sir don't you sir me i've got you and i'm going to use you but how do you know that i stole your sheep you know how i know it you know that just as soon as you see her be coming you shoved off and more than that you know that when i jumped in the canoe and started to paddle out out here why you shot at me you know all that well enough merciful heavens twain exclaimed yes i yes that's about what i allowed but the boat puffed on away a stick snapped outside great heavens twain thought is the girl coming no it was only a calf 
the expression on the old fellow's face grew harder there was a cruel twitching about the corners of his mouth oh don't you fret she'll be here directly my friend said twain with an effort to be calm if you will go with me over to arkansas city i will prove to you that i would not steal a sheep i don't want no proof that comes from that place you tell a lie and them fellers over there would swear to it now i see my little gal coming through yonder as i said just now if you got any powers you want said why well, i reckon you better say em would you commit murder would you steal a sheep surely not aha and surely i wouldn't be committing murder by killing such a feller as you er uh, don't move now uh, for if you do i'll drop you come quick now before the gal comes tell me if you know who did steal them sheep that is if you didn't i think i do twain quickly rejoined and then remembering the name of a steamboat engineer whom he'd known before the war he added joe billings stole your sheep the old fellow looked sharply at him and replied are you sure i am certain was you on his boat at the time uh, yes and tried to keep him from stealing them but could not will you help me find him yes well then scoot quick before the gal comes when twain reached arkansas city he found a perplexed and disappointed committee he was nervous and depressed while he was standing in the office of the hotel someone said mr clemens you used to know joe billings didn't you twain felt an uneasiness crawling over him yes he replied there he is twain looked around and started the old fellow who had held him in the cabin came forward snorted and then said sam i ought to shot you for not knowing me but i reckon i've changed some sheep why i never had one in my life <laughs> come fellers here's to sam and his ability to still hedge on the truth life on the mississippi appeared in eighteen eighty three it was a volume of reminiscences of his youthful days as a steamboat pilot on the father of waters this volume was followed in eighteen eighty five by the prince and the pauper which was a remarkable performance and a surprise even to the friends of mr clemens for many years he had been a conscientious and untiring student of language literature history not merely making up for deficiencies of early education but laying solid foundations and building on them a broad and liberal culture which made him a man of letters in the true sense of the term his thorough knowledge of english and american literature is supplemented by a knowledge of that of various other languages of which he has acquired a thorough command the story of the prince and the pauper for instance reveals somewhat the extent and fidelity of his study of early england and is a story that at the beginning of his career he could neither have thought out or appreciated and yet it is very distinctly marked with his peculiar native genius and humor the adventures of huckleberry finn were published in eighteen eighty six the manuscript was completed many months before the book appeared owing to complications and differences with the publishers and finally was published by mr clemens himself in this book mark twain was at his best the london athenaeum in reviewing the work said it is such a book as he and he only could have written it is meant for boys but there are few men we should hope who once they take it up will not delight in it it forms a companion or sequel to tom sawyer huckleberry finn as everybody knows is one of tom's closest friends and the present volume is a record of the adventures which befell him soon after the event which made him a person of property and brought tom sawyer's story to a becoming conclusion they are of the most surprising and delightful kind imaginable and in the course of them we fall in with a number of types of character of singular freshness and novelty 
besides being schooled in half a dozen extraordinary dialects we shall content ourselves with repeating that the book is mark twain at his best and remarking that jim and huckleberry are real creations and the worthy peers of the illustrious tom sawyer later appeared a connecticut yankee in king arthur's court and other volumes in all of his books there is common sense and love of justice and hatred of cant and a vein of serious earnestness even in his most comical writings that will for all time make him near to the people as the london daily news once said of him his gravity in narrating the most preposterous tale his sympathy with every one of his absurdest characters his microscopic imagination his vein of seriousness his contrasts of pathos his bursts of indignant plain speaking about certain national errors make mark twain an author of the highest merit and far remote from the mere buffoon end of chapter eight read by john greenman chapter nine of mark twain his life and work a biographical sketch by william m clemens this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 9. The Lecture Platform In 1884 Mark Twain and George W. Cable made a general tour of the country, each giving readings from his own works. Cordial receptions and crowded houses greeted them everywhere. The platform was not a novelty to Mark Twain. He had delivered lectures in California and Nevada in 1866 and 1867 had appeared in public upon several occasions in england and had spoken a number of times at dinners and banquets in new york and boston he became known as a man possessing remarkable powers of elocution and his parlor readings of shakespeare were said to be masterly performances strong inducements had been offered him to lecture abroad even so far away as australia in eighteen eighty four he consented to lecture in america for a period not exceeding five months in December 1884, Mark Twain and George W. Cable appeared in Cleveland. They arrived one afternoon and registered at the Forest City House. I called to pay my respects. Was Mr. Clemens in? Yes, but he had just eaten dinner, it then being three o'clock, and had gone to bed, not to be disturbed until seven o'clock, excepting in case Mr. John Hay, the author of Little Breeches, called. Mr. Clemens would see Mr. Hay, but no other human being could entice him from his bed. In the evening occurred the entertainment. Mr. Cable read passages from his novel Dr. Sevier. Mark Twain came upon the stage walking slowly, apparently in deep meditation. Those present saw a rather small man with a big head, with bushy gray hair, heavy dark eyebrows, a receding chin, a long face toothless gums visible between the lips, an iron-gray mustache, closely cut and stiff. The right hand involuntarily stroked the receding chin, and a merry twinkle came into his eyes as he advanced to the front of the stage and began to recite, in his peculiar drawling and deliberate way, King Solomon, taken from advance sheets of Huckleberry Finn. When he had finished, he turned and boyishly ran off the stage with a sort of dog-trot. Then I remember that Mr. Cable came on, told us all about Kate Riley and Ristoffolo, and then, in imitation of Mark Twain, tried to run off the stage in the same playful manner. I remember also what a deplorable failure Mr. Cable made of the attempt, how his gentle trot reminded me of a duck going downhill and how eventually he collided with one of the scenes, and lastly, how the audience roared with laughter. Then Mark came forward again with his tragic tale of the fishwife, followed by Cable, who walked soberly now, like a Baptist deacon. Twain told us of a trying situation, and finally concluded the entertainment with one of his inimitable ghost stories. He is a good talker, 
and invariably prepares himself, though he skillfully hides his preparation by his method of delivery, which denotes that he is getting his ideas and phrases as he proceeds. He is an accomplished artist in his way. His peculiar mode of expression always seems contagious with an audience, and a laugh would follow the most sober remark. It is a singular fact that an audience will be in a laughing mood when they first enter the lecture-room. They are ready to burst out at anything and everything. In the town of Colchester, Connecticut, there was a good illustration of this, the Honorable Demshane Hornet having a most unpleasant experience at the expense of Mark Twain. Mr. Clemens was advertised to lecture in the town of Colchester, but for some reason failed to arrive. In the emergency, the lecture committee decided to employ Mr. Hornet to deliver his celebrated lecture on temperance, but so late in the day was this arrangement made that no bills announcing it could be circulated, and the audience assembled, expecting to hear Mark Twain. No one in the town knew Mr. Clemens, or had ever heard him lecture, and they entertained the idea that he was funny, and went to the lecture prepared to laugh. Even those upon the platform, excepting the chairman, did not know Mr. Hornet from Mark Twain, and so, when he was introduced, thought nothing of the name, as they knew Mark Twain was a nom de plume, and supposed his real name was Hornet. Mr. Hornet bowed politely, looked about him, and remarked, Intemperance is the curse of the country. The audience burst into a merry laugh. He knew it could not be at his remark, and thought his clothes must be awry, and he asked the chairman in a whisper if he was all right, and received yes for an answer. Then he said, Rum slays more than disease. Another but louder laugh followed. He could not understand it, but proceeded. It breaks up happy homes. Still louder mirth. It is carrying young men down to death and hell. Then came a perfect roar of applause. Mr. Hornet began to get excited. He thought they were poking fun at him, but went on. We must crush the serpent. A tremendous howl of laughter. The men on the platform, except the chairman, squirmed as they laughed. Then Hornet got mad. What I say is gospel truth, he cried. The audience fairly bellowed with mirth. Hornet turned to a man on the stage and said, Do you see anything very ridiculous in my remarks or behavior? Yes, <laughs> it's intensely funny. <laughs> Go on, replied the roaring man. This is an insult, cried Hornet, wildly dancing about. More laughter and cries of, Go on, Twain! Then the chairman began to see through a glass darkly, and arose and quelled the merriment, and explained the situation, and the men on the stage suddenly ceased laughing, and the folks in the audience looked sheepish, and they quit laughing too, and then the excited Mr. Hornet, being thoroughly mad, told them he had never before got into a town so entirely populated with asses and idiots, and having said that, he left the hall in disgust, followed by the audience in deep gloom. When Mr. Clemens and Mr. Cable appeared in Albany, New York, they paid their respects to the governor and visited the state capitol. They entered the adjutant general's office, and finding the official out, they sat down to await his return. There were a considerable number of gentlemen in the party, and the chairs were soon occupied. Mr. Clemens sat down carelessly on one of the adjutant general's official tables. The party were chatting cheerfully and conducting themselves peacefully, when a dozen clerks and deputies of the department came rushing into the office, and with unusual vehemence asked what was wanted. None of the visiting party seemed to understand the situation. An investigation, however, disclosed the fact that Mark Twain, by accident or design, had planted himself squarely on a long row of electric buttons, and thus set ringing a score or more of call-bells. In Montreal, upon the occasion of Mark Twain's appearance, there were a large number of Frenchmen in the audience. This caused him to introduce his lecture the following. Where so many 
of the guests are French, the propriety will be recognized of my making a portion of my speech in the beautiful language in order that I may be partly understood. I speak French with timidity and not flowingly except when excited when using that language i have noticed that i have hardly ever been mistaken for a frenchman except perhaps by horses never i believe by people i had hoped that mere french construction with english words would answer but this is not the case i tried it at a gentleman's house in quebec and it would not work the maid-servant asked what would monsieur i said monsieur so-and-so is he with himself she did not understand I said, Is it that he is still not returned to his house of merchandise? She did not understand that either. I said, He will desolate himself when he learns that his friend American was arrived, and he not with himself to shake him at the hand she did not even understand that i don't know why but she didn't and she lost her temper besides somebody in the rear called out qui est donc là or words to that effect she said c'est un fou and shut the door on me perhaps she was right but how did she ever find that out for she had never seen me before till that moment but as i have already intimated i will close this oration with a few sentiments in the french language i have not ornamented them i have not burdened them with flowers of rhetoric for to my mind that literature is best and most enduring which is characterized by a noble simplicity j'ai bel bouton d'or de mon oncle mais je n'ai pas celui du charpentier si vous avez le fromage du brave menuisier c'est bon mais si vous ne l'avez pas ne vous désolez pas prenez le chapeau de drap noir de son beau-frère malade tout à l'heure savoir faire qu'est-ce que vous dites pâté de foie gras revenons à nos moutons pardon monsieur pardonnez-moi essayons à parler la belle langue d'ollendorf strains me more than you can possibly imagine but i mean well and i've done the best i could mr clemens met with an amusing adventure when he and mr cable were making their tour in the south a misguided but enthusiastic young man managed after some difficulty to secure an introduction to the humorist on a river steamer just before the latter's departure from new orleans for st louis the young man said i've read all of your writings mr twain but i think i like the heathen chinee the best of them all mr clemens shook the young man's hand with tremendous enthusiasm my dear sir he remarked i am pretty well used to compliments but i must say i never received one which gave me equal satisfaction and showed so kindly an appreciation of efforts to please the public a thousand thanks and the young man replied 
You are perfectly welcome, Mr. Twain. I am sure you deserve it. Shortly after his return from his lecture tour, the representative of a leading publishing house called upon Mr. Clemens at his Hartford residence, offering him his own price for a certain contribution which was specially desired. Well, I tell you, said Mark, with his inimitable drawl, I have just got a thundering big book through me, and an awful lecture course through the people of this unfortunate country, and I feel like an anaconda that had swallowed a, a goat. I don't want to turn over or wiggle again for six months. This was his way of declining the offer. After dinner speaking became as natural to Mr. Clemens as his appearance upon the lecture platform, and he has won the title of being the most entertaining table-talker in America. Not many years since he was present at a monthly meeting of the Military Service Institute on Governor's Island. General W. T. Sherman and General Schofield were present. Mr. Clemens said that that which he was about to read was part of a still uncompleted book of which he would give the first chapter by way of explanation and follow it with selected fragments or outline the rest of it in bulk so to speak do as the dying cowboy admonished his spiritual adviser to do just leave out the details and heave in the bottom facts once upon a time a military regiment from worcester massachusetts visited hartford and the humorist was put forward as the spokesman to welcome officially the soldier guests of the city among other things he said when asked to respond i said i would be glad to but <laughs> there were reasons why i could not make a speech but i said i would talk I never made a speech without getting together a lot of statistics and being instructive. A man who starts in upon a speech without preparation enters upon a sea of infelicities and troubles. I had thought of a great many things I had intended to say, in fact nearly all of these things I have heard here tonight I had thought of. Get a man away down here on the list, and he starts out empty. One reason I didn't like to come here to make a prepared speech was because I have sworn off. I have reformed. I would not make a prepared speech without statistics and philosophy. The advantage of a prepared speech is that you start when you are ready and stop when you get through. If unprepared, you are all at sea. You don't know where you are. I thought to achieve brevity, but I was mistaken. A man never hangs on so long on his hind legs as when he don't know when to stop. I once heard a man who tried to be reformed. He tried to be brief. A number of strangers sat in a hotel parlor. One sat off to one side and said nothing. Finally, all went out except one man and this dummy the dummy touched this man on the shoulder and said, I think I have whistles in you before. What makes you whistle? asked the other man. I used to stammer, and the doctor told me when I wanted to speak and stammered to whistle. I did, did whistle, 
and it c c c cured me so it is with a man who makes an unprepared speech he tries to be brief and it takes him longer i won't detain you we welcome you with cordial hospitality and if you will remain we will try and furnish better weather tomorrow one of his famous after-dinner speeches was in response to the toast the babies and another was his speech on woman at the annual dinner of the new england society some years ago he spoke immediately after general grant among the good things he said were the following the daughter of modern civilization is a marvel of exquisite and beautiful art and expense all the lands all the climes all the arts are laid under tribute to furnish her forth her linen is from belfast her robe is from paris her fan from japan her card-case is from china her watch is from geneva her hair from from i don't know where her hair is from i could never find out that is her other hair her public hair her sunday hair i don't mean the hair she goes to bed with why you ought to know the hair i mean it's that thing which she calls a switch and which resembles a switch as much as it does a brickbat or a shotgun it's that thing that she twists and then coils round and round her head beehive fashion and then tucks the end in under the hive and harpoons it with a hairpin in 1885 at the academy of music in philadelphia occurred a benefit performance for the actors fund the house was crowded joseph murphy had just given the graveyard scene from chalmeru the widower and his little son visit the grave of the wife and mother and go through some very pathetic incidents a delay occurred after the shan ru had sorrowfully led his offspring from the hallowed spot the audience was in the usual sympathetic condition after the scene and noses were blown generously in the commendable effort to brace up for the appearance of mark twain who was to come on next and read his ridiculous tale of a fishwife the dozen mounds with their crosses and headpieces that had been used to make up the scene of the cemetery had not been removed and the idea that the humorist would have to read his nonsense in such surroundings caused anxiety twain was standing at the wing ready to go on and many saw him the uneasiness of the people became more universal as it now seemed inevitable that a most grotesque picture would be thrust upon them an appalling blunder in stage management seemed about to be committed the gentlemen who had charge of the entertainment were sitting in a box at the right of the stage and could plainly see twain's embarrassment both made a rush for behind the scenes to order the removal of the graves but they were too late as they flew through the box door mark twain stepped cautiously on the stage he took a couple of steps forward glanced up at the picture before him and stopped short he turned his head toward whence he had come as though looking for the manager gave an agonizing glance of appeal muttered something that had the tone of vigor but at last went ahead he made his way down to the footlights with halting uncertain steps fumbling his notes between his fingers and casting nervous looks at the solemn signs of death that half surrounded him at last he got squarely before the audience by this time every person in the house was thoroughly uncomfortable a weak effort at applause had been made by some of the bravest hearted on the appearance of the humorist but mark's indifference to the reception and the overwhelming incongruity of the scene had a saddening effect the house became so still 
that the rolling of a ball of cotton could have been heard. He stood before the leader of the orchestra like a schoolboy about to speak his first piece. Never a model of the aesthetic in action, he was now painfully awkward and confused. He twisted his notes and wiggled his fingers, every now and then looking over his shoulder at the scene of death with gazes of suspicion and apprehension. He remained looking foolish for many seconds, two or three times making an ineffectual attempt to say something. At length he found voice, and in his drawling tones, even longer drawn out than usual, the embarrassed reader said, Ladies and gentlemen, uh, this uh, uh, melancholy occasion gives me an, an opportunity to make an um, explanation that I have long desired to deliver myself of. I rise to a question of the highest privilege before a Philadelphia audience. The audience, without the remotest idea of what was coming, still sat quiet and expectant. Mr. Clemens continued, In the course of my checkered career I have on divers occasions been charged always maliciously, of course, with more or less serious offenses. It is in reply to one of the more um, important of these that I wish to speak. More than once I have been accused of writing the obituary poetry in the Philadelphia Ledger. A gentle smile was seen to pass over the faces of the multitude, and pleasant feeling began to assert itself. I wish right here, went on Mr. Clemens with gathered self-possession, to deny that terrible assertion. The audience now laughed outright, and comfort was pretty well restored. I will admit that once, when a compositor in the ledger establishment, I did set up some of that poetry, but for a worse offense than that, no indictment can be found against me. And then, in an outraged manner, the humorist exclaimed, I did not write that poetry, and then, after a pause, at least not all of it. The reader had his hearers with him after that, and he never read his tale of a fishwife to a more appreciative audience. End of chapter 9 Read by John Greenman This is chapter 10 of Mark Twain, His Life and Work, a biographical sketch by William M. Clemens. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 10. Mark Twain at Home. Read by John Greenman. When, in 1868, Samuel L. Clemens visited the city of Hartford, Connecticut, to arrange for the publication of his first book, Innocence Abroad, he was captivated by the old town and its beautiful suburbs. Later, in 1871, when he determined upon leaving Buffalo and taking up his residence in an eastern city, it was not strange that he should select Hartford as the site for his permanent home. In a corner of the Nook Farm on Farmington Avenue, about a mile and a quarter from business center of the city, he built a large, unique house of brick and stone. The building was of the Queen Anne style of architecture, which, just at that time, was the most popular as well as the most aristocratic mode of residence in vogue. There were gables and arches and quaint windows, and in many of these boxes of flowers were placed. 
the house was built in the center of a park-like grove of old trees and the hand of a scotch landscape artist soon molded hedges flower beds and a well-kept lawn today it stands a home of homes a port cochere covered with vines extends from the entrance under which the carriages drive the exterior of the house has the air of a luxurious old english home from the day that mark twain and his young wife took up their abode in their hartford home money was expended with lavish hands and the result has been a rich charming artistic and homelike interior one is ushered into an immense square hall the floor of which is in marble tiles of peculiar pattern a winding staircase very wide and massive of heavily carved english oak extends above opposite the front door are double doors leading into the library near these doors in the hall stands upon a marble pedestal the bust of mr clemens executed by young carl gerhardt there are also paintings on the carved oaken walls of the hall and a heavily carved table to the right are double doors leading into the large drawing-room all the doors and windows are draped at the top by handsome lambrequins the doors and woodwork are of dark polished wood covered with stencil designs in metallic paint so that at a short distance they look as if inlaid with mother-of-pearl the drawing-room is furnished with light-colored satin furniture leading from this apartment is the dining-room which is finished in heavy carved woods of the most elaborate workmanship high carved dado old tapestry portier a massive buffet covered with cut glass and silverware an odd idea is a window directly over the fireplace it is of one solid piece of plate glass surrounded by a frame of dark blue glass and inside that like the mat of a picture opal glass as one looks out at the beautiful landscape he can hardly realize at first that it is nature's handiwork thus framed in instead of a painting actually hanging upon the wall the flue of the fireplace extends each side of this picturesque window connected with the dining-room is the library which is the general living-room it has large double doors leading into the front hall opposite the entrance it is a sunny cheerful room with a huge heavily carved fireplace which mr clemens brought from europe where it had once held place in an ancient castle it seems to have brought with it to this american home some of the dignity pomp and splendor of which it once formed an important part the room looks as if it belonged to a baronial castle but in winter it is less somber and a blazing fire of logs burns behind the brass fender bringing into greater prominence the motto cut in brass above the fire the ornament of a house is the friends that frequent it on either side are low bookshelves built against the wall they form a part of the massive chimney-piece and look like wings of a great bat the floor is covered with rugs and luxurious seats are fitted into the windows a large carved table stands in the center covered with magazines and papers the whole house has rather the appearance of an old castle with the carvings grotesque and ponderous instead of the old mahogany of colonial days a wide oaken staircase leads to the apartments above the most conspicuous of which is a large room fitted up most comfortably with cozy nooks filled in with cushioned seats beyond is a room in which a large rocking-horse and scattered toys make one acquainted with the reason mr clemens ceased writing in this attractive apartment and moved still further upstairs to a corner of the billiard-room each suite of apartments has its separate bathroom one guest-chamber is furnished in pink silk even the bedstead is of pink silk tufted all over with tiny satin buttons the study or workroom of the humorist is the billiard room upon the upper floor the windows of which look out upon the broad acres of beautiful landscape in the distance is heard the ripple of park river in the corner of the room is his writing table covered usually with books manuscripts letters and other literary litter and in the middle of the room stands the billiard table 
Mr. Clemens is an expert billiard player, and when he tires of writing at his little desk in the corner, he rises and makes some scientific strokes with the cue. A resident of Hartford says that he called upon Mark once in the billiard room when the fire in the grate threw some sparks out upon the floor. These caught some loose paper and the room for a moment promised to break out in flames. Twain was playing billiards at the time, says the man, and he did not stop his game. He immediately rung for the servants and lazily told them that they had better extinguish the fire, and with that he leaned over the table and made a stroke with his billiard cue which would have done honor to the world's champion. Twain never gets excited. The study is a long room with sloping sides formed by the roof. There are three balconies adjacent, two large ones on either side, and one at the end. One may step out into these through regular doors. His mode of work in this study is systematic. He makes it an invariable rule to perform a certain amount of literary work every day, and his working hours are made continuous by his not taking any midday meal. He is merciless toward his own productions, and has often destroyed an entire day's labor as soon as it was written. He found by experience that the final result was more satisfactory by taking this course than by trying to remodel what he considered a faulty manuscript. In this way he has destroyed hundreds of pages of manuscript, and from one of his larger books he culled out no less than five hundred pages. Since his advent in the city of Hartford, Mark Twain has won for himself the name of Prince of Entertainers. Seated in his richly furnished library, to whose beauty and artistic completeness half the lands of Europe have contributed, he will tell an anecdote or discuss a literary or social question with a calm directness and earnestness, revealing to you an entire new side of his character that has nothing in common with that which he is wont to display to the public who throng to his lectures. Even his drollest stories he relates with this same earnest impressiveness, and with a face as serious as a sexton's. His brilliancy has a certain delightful quality which is almost too evanescent to be imprisoned in any one phrase. You have no oppressive consciousness that you are expected to laugh. You rather feel as if the talker had unexpectedly taken you into his confidence, and you feel your heart going out toward him in return. He is a reader of the finest discriminating faculty, high dramatic power, and remarkable sympathetic interpretation, and his reading of Browning, whom he greatly admires, is a rare entertainment. He is a leading member of the Monday Evening Club of Hartford, the Authors' Club, the Century Club, the Actors' Club of New York, and other social and literary organizations. During the summer months, Mr. Clemens and his family sojourn at Quarry Farm, near Elmira, New York, at the home of Mr. T. W. Crane, whose wife is a sister of Mrs. Clemens. Here, among the historic hills of the Chemung Valley, the humorist works with the same systematic rule as in the study of his Hartford house. A friend who visited Mr. Clemens in his summer retreat writes as follows. A summer house has been built for Mr. Clemens within the Crane grounds on a high peak which stands six hundred feet above the valley that lies spread out before it. The house is built almost entirely of glass and is modeled exactly on the plan of a Mississippi steamboat's pilot house. Here, shut off from all outside communication, Mr. Clemens does the hard work of the year, or rather the confining and engrossing work of writing which demands continuous application day after day. The lofty workroom is some distance from the house. He goes to it every morning about half-past eight and stays there until called to dinner by the blowing of a horn about five o'clock. He takes no lunch or noon meal of any sort, and works without eating, while the rules are imperative not to disturb him during this working period. His only recreation is his cigar. Another correspondent wrote as follows. 
to keep away the large number of visitors and sightseers who come to view the sanctum twain posted upon his door the following notice step softly keep away do not disturb the remains in spite of this characteristic warning we open the door and enter the floor is bare there is a table in the center of the room covered with books newspapers manuscripts and all the paraphernalia of authorship over the fireplace is a shelf on which rests a few books and a couple of boxes of choice cigars an intimate acquaintance writing of mr clemens and the tobacco habit says he is an inveterate smoker and smokes constantly while it is work and indeed all the time from half past eight in the morning to half past ten at night stopping only when at his meals a cigar lasts him about forty minutes now that he has reduced to an exact science the act of reducing the weed to ashes so he smokes from fifteen to twenty cigars every day some time ago he was persuaded to stop the practice and actually went a year and more without tobacco but he found himself unable to carry along important work which he undertook and it was not until he resumed smoking that he could do it since then his faith in his cigar has not wavered like other american smokers mr clemens is unceasing in his search for the really satisfactory cigar at a really satisfactory price and first and last has gathered a good deal of experience in the pursuit it is related that having entertained a party of gentlemen one winter evening in hartford he gave to each just before they left the house one of a new sort of cigar that he was trying to believe was the object of his search he made each guest light it before starting the next morning he found all that he had given away lying on the snow beside the pathway across his lawn each smoker had been polite enough to smoke until he got out of the house but every one on gaining his liberty had yielded to the instinct of self-preservation and tossed the cigar away forgetting that it would be found there by daylight the testimony of the next morning was overwhelming and the verdict against the new brand was accepted some years ago in making a phrenological examination of mark twain professor beale of cincinnati made report as follows wit humor are very familiar words and yet from the difficulty in defining them or from not distinguishing the particular mental mechanism upon which they depend the relative merits of many authors are often but vaguely understood wit is primarily an intellectual perception of incongruity or unexpected relations but the idea that anything thus apprehended is ludicrous is suggested by the effective faculty of mirthfulness in the same manner that the understanding may perceive a dangerous object and thus arouse the emotion of fear the relation between the intellectual faculties and the feelings is reciprocal so that the sentiment of the ludicrous when strong may prompt the intellect to create imaginary senses or associated ideas adapted to gratify it or become active as the result of real perceptions talent for wit then depends upon certain intellectual activities combined with the sentiment of mirth but humor introduces another element namely secretiveness this propensity not only creates the desire to conceal one's own thoughts but gives almost equal pleasure in penetrating the disguises of others it enables a joker to keep a straight face while telling a story and the secretiveness of the listener is gratified by detecting the absurdity in the narrative beneath the assumed gravity of the speaker that is to the amusing incongruity of the events in the story is added the further incongruity between the character of the story and the serious countenance of the narrator 
the English and Italians are more humorous than witty, the reverse of which is true of the French. Mark Twain is excellent in wit, but super excellent in humor. Secretiveness is very marked in the diameter of his head just above the ears, and is indicated also by the width of his nostrils, the nearly closed eyes, compressed lips, slow, guarded manner of speech, etc. His nose is of the apprehensive type, in its great length and somewhat hooked point, but it is not thick enough above the nostrils to indicate taste for commerce. This apprehensive or cautious nasal organ, so prominent in Dante, Calvin, and other men celebrated for earnestness and gravity, uh, might seem an anomaly in this case but for the explanation that cautiousness and secretiveness are essential ingredients in genuine humor on this principle we can account for the temperament of our great humorist which is not the laughing fat rotund vital but rather the spare angular mental or mental motive which is favorable to hard sense logic general intelligence and insight into human nature his intellect is well balanced having a strong foundation of perceptive faculties which gather details with the fidelity of a camera he has also a large upper forehead giving philosophical power ability to generalize reason plan and see a long way ahead the middle centers or memory of events criticism and comparison are also well developed his eyes are rather deeply set and his language is subordinate to his thought the hollow temples indicate but little music and mirthfulness at the upper corners of the forehead is by no means remarkable ideality or love of beauty is only fair the head measures twenty two and a half inches which is half an inch less than the average intellectual giant but the fiber of the whole man is fine close and strong and the cerebral combination is of a very available sort he has very ardent affections strong love of approbation sense of justice firmness kindness and ability to read character with small self-esteem love of gain or inclination to the supernatural knowledge of the world and interest in humanity are his leading traits and altogether he is a phenomenal man of whom americans may well be proud being extremely domestic in his tastes mark twain is fond of his home life and of his beautiful children his eldest daughter susie was born in eighteen seventy two clara langhorne was born in eighteen seventy four and Jean in 1880. Another child, a son, died in infancy. Mrs. Clemens is described as gentle, quiet, and motherly, ten years younger than her husband. Mr. Clemens is reported to have said that when his mother died there would be no one left in the family to appreciate his jokes. It is said Mrs. Clemens is particularly slow in these matters, she dresses very plainly, wearing her dark hair smoothly brushed from the parting in the center, with no crimps or attempt at dressing. She appears still more sedate by usually wearing eyeglasses. She is, however, noted for her goodness and for being a fond mother. For many years the near neighbors of the family have been the families of Mr. Charles Dudley Warner, Mr. George Warner, Reverend Mr. Twitchell, and Mrs. Harriet Beecher Stowe. It is said that once, when Mr. Clemens, at the solicitation of his wife, called on Mrs. Stowe, he was so absent-minded as to put on neither collar nor necktie. On Mrs. Clemens remonstrating on his return, he said he would make it all right, and accordingly sent a collar and tie of his over to Mrs. Stowe in a box. Miss Susie has always been Mark's favorite child, she inherits much of her father's brightness. 
she kept a diary at one time in which she noted the occurrences in the family and among other things the sayings of her parents on one page she wrote that father sometimes used stronger words when mother wasn't by and he thought we didn't hear mrs clemens found the diary and showed it to her husband probably thinking the particular page worth his notice after this clemens did and said several things that were intended to attract the child's attention and found them duly noted afterward but one day the following entry occurred i don't think i'll put down anything more about father for i think he does things to have me notice him and i believe he reads this diary of the clemens children a correspondent of a chicago newspaper tells of their adventures with their father while on a visit to that city as follows we came in last night said mark pulling at the left side of his mustache mrs clemens is not very well neither am i i have been amusing the children i have taken them to a panorama i understand there are three others near here i will take them there too i want to satiate them with battles it may amuse them three little girls composed of three red gowns three red parasols and six blue stockings stood on the steps and laughed run up and tell mamma what a jolly time you've had and i'll think of something else to amuse you when the three little girls had disappeared mr clemens sighed did you ever try to amuse three little girls at the same time he asked after a pause it requires genius i wonder whether they would like to bathe in the lake he continued with sudden animation hardly pausing five minutes between each word it might amuse them are you on your vacation trip mr clemens no i have just returned from a visit to my mother in keokuk iowa we came from buffalo to duluth by a lake steamer and then from st paul down the river to keokuk neither in this country nor in any other have i seen such interesting scenery as that along the upper mississippi one finds all that the hudson affords bluffs wooded highlands and a great deal in addition between st paul and the mouth of the illinois river there are over four hundred islands strung out in every possible shape a river without islands is like a woman without hair she may be good and pure but one doesn't fall in love with her very often did you ever fall in love with a bald-headed woman the reporter admitted that he had drawn the line there i never did either continued mr clemens meditatively at least i think i never did there is no place for loafing more satisfactory than the pilot-house of a mississippi steamboat it amuses the children to see the pilot monkey with the wheel traveling by boat is the best way to travel unless one can stay at home on a lake or river boat one is as thoroughly cut off from letters and papers and the tax collector as though he were amid sea moreover one doesn't have the discomforts of seafaring it is very unpleasant to look at seasick people at least so my friends said the last time i crossed it might amuse the children though 
suggested the reporter. I hadn't thought of that, replied Mr. Clemens. But perhaps it might. The lake seems rather rough today. I wonder whether one could get a boat, a little boat, that would bob considerably. Yes, it might amuse the children. But at such a sacrifice. You are not a parent, replied the humorist. It is strange, continued Mr. Clemens, in a momentary forgetfulness of the children, how little has been written about the upper Mississippi. The river below St. Louis has been described time and again, and it is the least interesting part. One can sit in the pilot house for a few hours and watch the low shores, the ungainly trees, and the democratic buzzards, and then one might as well go to bed. One has seen everything there is to see. Along the upper Mississippi every hour brings something new. There are crowds of odd islands, bluffs, prairies, hills, woods, and villages, everything one could desire to amuse the children. A few people ever think of going there, however. Dickens, Corbett, Mother Trollope, and the other discriminating English people who wrote up the country before 1842 had hardly any idea that such a stretch of river scenery existed. Their successors have followed in their footsteps, and as we form our opinions of our country from what other people say of us, of course we ignore the finest part of the Mississippi. At this moment the three little girls in the three red gowns and six blue stockings appeared, and Mr. Clemens assumed the shape of an amusement bureau. An instance of his home life is the following anecdote. Having been asked to contribute to a newspaper issued at the fair in aid of the abused children in Boston, he wrote, Why should I want a society for the prevention of cruelty to children to prosper when I have a baby downstairs that kept me awake several hours last night with no pretext for it but to make trouble. This occurs every night, and it embitters me, because I see how needless it was to put in the other burglar alarm, a costly and complicated contrivance which cannot be depended upon, because it's always getting out of order, whereas, although the baby is always getting out of order, too, it can nevertheless be depended upon. Yes, I am bitter against your society, for I think the idea of it is all wrong. But if you will start a society for the prevention of cruelty to fathers, I will write you a whole book. At a Hartford dinner party one day, the subject of eternal life and future punishment came up for a lengthy discussion in which Mark Twain, who was present, took part. A lady near him turned suddenly toward him and exclaimed, "'Why do you not say anything? I want your opinion.' Mr. Clemens replied gravely, "'Madam, you must excuse me. I am silent of necessity. I have friends in both places. End of chapter 10. Read by John Greenman.